TradeMoneyATM.com. Introduction to the Art of Money Getting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Introduction. In the United States, where we have more land than people, it is not at all difficult for persons in good health to make money. In this comparatively new field, there are so many avenues of success open, so many vocations, which are not crowded, that any person of either sex who is willing, at least for the time being, to engage in any respectable occupation that offers, may find lucrative employment. Those who really desire to attain an independence have only to set their minds upon it and adopt the proper means as they do in regard to any other object which they wish to accomplish, and the thing is easily done. But, however easy it may be found to make money, I have no doubt many of my hearers will agree it is the most difficult thing in the world to keep it. The road to wealth is, as Dr. Franklin truly says, as plain as the road to the mill. It consists simply in expending less than we earn. That seems to be a very simple problem. Mr. Micaber, one of those happy creations of the genial Dickens, puts the case in a strong light when he says that to have annual income of 20 pounds per annum and spend 20 pounds and sixpence is to be the most miserable of men, whereas to have an income of only 20 pounds and spend but 19 pounds and sixpence is to be the happiest of mortals. Many of my readers may say, we understand this, this is economy, and we know economy is wealth. We know we can't eat our cake and keep it also. Yet I beg to say that perhaps more cases of failure arise from mistakes on this point than almost any other. The fact is, many people think they understand economy when they really do not. True economy is misapprehended, and people go through life without properly comprehending what that principle is. One says, I have an income of so much, and here is my neighbor who has the same, yet every year he gets something ahead and I fall short. Why is it? I know all about economy. He thinks he does, but he does not. There are men who think that economy consists in saving cheese parings and candle ends, and cutting off two pence from the laundress bill, and doing all sorts of little, mean, dirty things. Economy is not meanness. The misfortune is also that the class of persons let their economy apply in only one direction. They fancy they are so wonderfully economical in saving a half penny, where they ought to send two pence that they think they can afford to squander in other directions. A few years ago, before kerosene oil was discovered or thought of, one might stop overnight at almost any farmer's house in the agricultural districts and get a very good supper, but after supper he might attempt to read in the sitting room and would find it impossible with the inefficient light of one candle. The hostess, seeing his dilemma, would say, It is rather difficult to read here in evenings. The proverb says you must have a ship at sea in order to be able to burn two candles at once. We never have an extra candle except on extra occasions. These extra occasions occur perhaps twice a year. In this way, the good woman saves five, six, or ten dollars in that time. But the information which might be derived from having the extra light would, of course, far outweigh a ton of candles. But the trouble does not end here. Feeling that she is so economical in tallow candies, she thinks she can afford to go frequently to the village and spend twenty or thirty dollars for ribbons and furbelows, many of which are not necessary. This false connote may frequently be seen in men of business, and in those instances it often runs to writing paper. You find good businessmen who save all the old envelopes and scraps, and would not tear a new sheet of paper if they could avoid it for the world. This is all very well. They may in this way save five or ten dollars a year, but being so economical, only in note paper, 
they think they can afford to waste time, to have expensive parties, and to drive their carriages. This is an illustration of Dr. Franklin's saving at the spigot and wasting at the bunghole, penny-wise and pound-foolish. Punch, in speaking of this, one idea class of people says, they are like the man who bought a penny hearing for his family's dinner and then hired a coach and four to take it home. I never knew a man to succeed by practicing this kind of economy. True economy consists in always making the income exceed the outgo. Wear the old clothes a little longer if necessary. Dispense with the new pair of gloves. Mend the old dress. Live on plainer food if need be, so that, under all circumstances, unless some unforeseen accident occurs, there will be a margin in favor of the income. A penny here and a dollar there, placed at interest, goes on accumulating, and in this way the desired result is attained. It requires some training, perhaps, to accomplish this economy. But when once used to it, you will find there is more satisfaction in rational saving than in irrational spending. Here is a recipe which I recommend. I have found it to work an excellent cure for extravagance and especially for mistaken economy. When you find that you have no surplus at the end of the year and yet have a good income, I advise you to take a few sheets of paper and form them into a book and mark down every item of expenditure. Post it every day or week in two columns, one headed necessaries or even comforts, and the other headed luxuries, and you will find that the latter column will be double treble and frequently ten times greater than the former. The real comforts of life cost but a small portion of what most of us can earn. Dr. Franklin says, it is the eyes of others and not our own eyes which ruin us. If all the world were blind except myself, I should not care for fine clothes or furniture. It is the fear of what Mrs. Grande may say that keeps the noses of many worthy families to the grindstone. In America, many persons like to repeat, we are all free and equal, but it is a great mistake in more senses than one. That we are born free and equal is a glorious truth in one sense. Yet we are not all born equally rich, and we never shall be. One may say, there is a man who has an income of $50,000 per annum. Well, I have but $1,000. I knew that fellow when he was poor like myself. Now he is rich and thinks he is better than I am. I will show him that I am as good as he is. I will go and buy a horse and buggy. No, I cannot do that. But I will go and hire one and ride this afternoon on the same road that he does, and thus prove to him that I am as good as he is. My friend, you need not take that trouble. You can easily prove that you are as good as he is. You have only to behave as well as he does, but you cannot make anybody believe that you are as rich as he is. Besides, if you put on these airs, add waste your time and spend your money, your poor wife will be obliged to scrub her fingers off at home and buy her tea, two ounces at a time, and everything else in proportion, in order that you may keep up appearances and, after all, deceive nobody. On the other hand, Mrs. Smith may say that her next-door neighbor married Johnson for his money, and everybody says so. She has a nice $1,000 camel's hair shawl, and she will make Smith get her an imitation one, and she will sit in a pew right next to her neighbor in church in order to prove that she is her equal. My good woman, you will not get ahead in the world if your vanity and envy thus take the lead. In this country, where we believe the majority ought to rule, we ignore that principle in regard to fashion, and let a handful of people calling themselves the aristocracy run up a false standard of perfection, and endeavoring to rise to that standard, we constantly keep ourselves poor, all the time digging away for the sake of outside appearances, how much wiser to be a law unto ourselves and say, we will regulate our outgo by our income and lay up something for a rainy day. People ought to be as sensible on the subject of money getting as on any other subject. Like causes produces like effects. You cannot accumulate a fortune by taking the road that leads to poverty. It needs no profit to tell us that those who live fully up to their means 
without any thought of a reverse in this life, can never attain a pecuniary independence. Men and women accustomed to gratify every whim and caprice will find it hard, at first, to cut down their various unnecessary expenses, and will feel it a great self-denial to live in a smaller house than they have been accustomed to, with less expensive furniture, less company, less costly clothing, fewer servants, a less number of balls, parties, theater goings, carriage ridings, pleasure excursions, cigar smokings, liquor drinkings, and other extravagances. But, after all, if they will try the plan of laying by a nest egg, or in other words, a small sum of money, at interest or judiciously invested in land, they will be surprised at the pleasure to be derived from constantly adding to their little pile as well as from all the economical habits which are engendered by this course. The old suit of clothes and the old bonnet and dress will answer for another season. Their croton or spring water tastes better than champagne. A cold bath and a brisk walk will prove more exhilarating than a ride in the finest coach. A social chat, an evening's reading in the family circle, or an hour's play of hunt the slipper and blind man's buff, will be far more pleasant than a fifty or five hundred dollar party when the reflection on the difference in cost is indulged in by those who begin to know the pleasures of saving. Thousands of men are kept poor, and tens of thousands are made so after they have acquired quite sufficient to support them well through life. In consequence of laying their plans of living on too broad a platform, some families expend $20,000. Some families expend $20,000 per annum and some much more and would scarcely know how to live on less, while others secure more solid enjoyment frequently on a twentieth part of that amount. Prosperity is a more severe ordeal than adversity. TradeMoneyATM.com